Okay, so theoretically we are recording, um, so that is cool. All right, so welcome everybody back to class. Um, so last time we actually saw each other, um, we had just finished up the gas laws chapter. So um, gas laws we're going to be considering done with at this point as a group. We are going to do on to thermochemistry though. Um, so without further ado, let's get to it. I'm going to, while I'm doing that, I'm going to try to see if I can get the lighting here just a little bit better so that you can see, uh, the slides and not as much me anyways. So the beginning part of the thermochemistry lab is actually going to be, or I'm sorry, the beginning of the thermochemistry chapter is going to be very definition heavy. Um, and that's just kind of the way it goes. Um, sorry about that ahead of time, but it, that it is what it is. Um, I am going to ask you guys to read the book and hopefully you saw my email where you have access to the online copy of the book for free. Um, cause I know that some people probably just have left a lot of stuff at school or otherwise and may have not collected everything at this point. Um, if you need assistance finding that copy of the online book, please let me know and I'll do my best to help you out with that. All right. So if we're going to talk about thermochemistry, there's a couple of classifications of energy that we need to talk about. And if you had a high school physics class, this is probably going to sound pretty familiar to you. Uh, the first one is potential energy and the second one is kinetic energy. Um, and these two kind of operate in uh, tandem with one another. So you've got potential energy, which gets converted into kinetic energy and kinetic energy, which gets converted back into potential energy. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how that conversion and that interplay works here in a little bit. Um, the nice thing is that mathematically we can define kinetic energy. And so we use this equation here. Uh, which is kinetic energy equals uh, one-half uh, mass times speed. Um, and the mass we're going to say is in kilograms, and the speed we're going to measure in meters per second. And um, these slides are all going to be posted on the support site as well. So if you're um, concerned about getting exact details like that, one, you're going to be able to rewatch the video. Um, two, you are going to... Um, have these slides. Um, why am I telling you what the definition is for uh, kinetic energy? Well, that's because kinetic energy, based off this definition, would, strictly speaking, have the unit of kilograms times meters squared uh, per second squared. Cool, you've probably never used that definition except for in a physics class because what we normally say is just joules. So that J for joules. Um, the joules punchline here is a derived unit. So it's not one of our SI units. That's the biggie to take away from that slide. Um, and if I'm going too fast, by all means, just let me know. Okay, so time for some more definitions. In thermochemistry, we're gonna talk a lot about energy. And so we just gave you that definition for how we're gonna measure it in terms of units, joules. We're also gonna talk about work and work is somehow related to energy. We just know that by being people here on the planet Earth. How are these two related to one another? Well, the definition of work that we're gonna use is this uh, force times distance. And I had a tennis ball over here because I happen to be in a basement right now. Um, but let's see, is it too far away? I'm sharing this basement with my kids. So I'm gonna grab that ball real quick. All right. Ugh. And this is the nice baby gate to keep the kids from my computer. It's really fun. So, we got ourselves a ball right here. It's not a tennis ball, but it still is foamy. And uh, thanks to the chroma key, it's kind of disappearing. 
So good job, it. What happens when we drop the ball? Well, gravity kicks in, right? Real exciting. And probably heard that through the mic. So let's describe that action of dropping and the ball falling in terms of energy. So when we pick the ball up, we are putting energy into the ball. Specifically, we're transferring energy and the ball is storing it as potential energy. So right now, the ball's up here, nice and high. It's got potential energy. It's not got any, we don't say that it is releasing any kinetic energy. But as soon as we drop the ball, it starts converting that potential energy that it has into kinetic energy. And the maximum amount of kinetic energy it has is right before the ball hits the ground. Excuse me. Now, if the collision were perfectly elastic, we talked a little bit about elast uh, elastic collisions in the gas chapter. Um, if the ball, if the collision were perfectly elastic, the ball would bounce right back up to its original place. But we know that it doesn't do that. Um, so we are living in an inelastic world. It's kind of a weird Madonna reference. Um, when the ball is rising after the bounce though, it is gaining potential energy. So we have this seesaw of potential energy transferring to kinetic energy as the ball falls, and then as the ball comes back up, the kinetic energy is getting transferred into potential energy. In an idealized world, the amount of potential energy and the amount of kinetic energy, if we have the ball at this height, would be constant. That is to say that they would constantly, like right now when the ball is not falling, it's got nothing but potential energy, but the potential energy plus the kinetic energy would equal some constant value. As the ball is falling, it is losing potential energy, but the amount of potential energy it's losing is equal to the amount of kinetic energy it is gaining. The energy is remaining constant. A lot of talk about energy right there and uh, specifically, we're talking about work. Now, if you are from a, if you have experience with a physics class uh, previously, you've probably described other uh, definitions of work. Um, but this is the one that we're specifically going to be talking about with uh, the thermochemistry course that we're having. So, like I said, uh, reality is that potential energy is lost and not all of it's turned into kinetic energy. The potential energy uh, gets transferred to kinetic energy, but it also gets transferred into the surface of the table that you can't see when the ball hits it, as well as the surrounding uh, air atoms um, that the ball is having to move out of the way. So you lose uh, potential energy to other things besides, um, well, you lose potential energy to the things around the ball. So the ball is not this individual isolated system. So that's gonna be a key word that we're gonna use here later, system, versus things that are around the ball, which we could say are surroundings. Another thing that uh, where we can lose energy is in terms of temperature. And this is where heat is gonna come into play. So heat is going to be described as the transfer of energy uh, between two objects due to a temperature difference. So if two things are next to one another, and you've probably done this experiment yourself, if you've ever taken an ice cube and put it in your hand, right? Um, your hand and your ice cube, eventually, if you hold onto the ice cube long enough, um, they reach the same temperature. So heat gets transferred between the ice cube and your hand until the temperature equals. And we're going to actually describe that process mathematically as part of this chapter. So the punchline of this is we can transfer energy uh, via work. So that whole dropping of the ball thing. But we can also transfer energy in terms of heat. And we are going to take both of these into consideration with chemical reactions. Okay, how are we feeling so far? A lot of terms there so far. Good? Is this working? Are you able to see the screen enough? Okie doke. So let's talk about some other terms.
Now I alluded to this one a little bit ago. Uh, this one is gonna be the system. The system is, in thermochemistry speak, is the part of the universe that we're studying. So let's go back to our ball for an example. Um, the ball here is, in that dropping example, the thing that we were studying. So of everything that ever that is existent in the universe right now in whatever shape or form, this is what we would consider our system. Our surroundings technically are everything else in the universe. That is to say the, I don't remember if it is or isn't at this point in time, planet, planetoid, whatever Pluto is. Pluto is technically part of our surroundings of this ball when we're talking about thermochemistry. Now it's a little ridiculous to talk about Pluto and this ball. Uh, so, because there's just such a great distance between them and anything that's happening to this ball is cannot possibly, well, it might possibly, but the statistical chance of this thing impacting Pluto is ridiculously small. So typically when we talk about surroundings, we talk about the universe that has direct contact to the thing. So in this case, it would be the air right around our ball. Um, and when we dropped it, it would be the table uh, because the table and the ball are hitting one another. So in thermochemistry, we're saying that energy is gonna get exchanged between a system and its surroundings. Now, I would like to make a call out here with regard to engineers. Um, engineers will use the same terms as system and surroundings, but you have to be careful. Um, everybody who's not an engineer, you're okay. Everybody who is an engineer, um, be careful because chemists and engineers use reverse definitions for system and surroundings. A lot of times um, an engineer will be thinking about everything else that's around whatever is being studied as the system. And then they'll be looking at the thing um, that a chemist would normally say is the system, the thing inside the vat or whatever as the surroundings. In chemistry speak, these are the definitions that we're using. The thing that we're studying is the system. Everything else around it is the surroundings. So if we think about an example of a beaker, um, and let's say we have a solution inside the beaker, we can ask ourselves, well, what is the system and what are the surroundings? So we have to be pretty careful here. Um, specifically, in a beaker, we're typically monitoring the thing that's inside the beaker, right? There's some kind of chemical reaction that might be taking place. So we have to be careful when we define what the system is then. The si Can you all hear the kids? It's hilarious. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. The, um, they're totally fine. It's just they're playing with grandma and they got quite loud. That too, a little stomping on the ground. Okay, sorry distracted. See, some things don't change. If we're looking inside the beaker, we want to look specifically at the solution to be the system. The beaker itself is going to be part of our surroundings. The air above the beaker is going to be part of our surroundings because we're not studying the beaker we're not studying the air. Those are the things that are around the thing that we are studying. So as we go forward in the course or with this chapter, we're going to, one of the best things you can possibly do is to stop and ask yourself, what is my system? What are my surroundings? And a lot of times put, writing that out on the side of a question or whatnot, uh, your work, will help you when it comes to doing the math later on. So let's talk, let's talk about a few types of systems that we possibly have. Um, our basic, or I won't say our basic, um, 
Our first one is an open system. And this is gonna be something that interacts with our surroundings pretty readily. Um, a really good example of an open system is a cup of coffee. So if you have like a cup of coffee here, I'm gonna take the lid off. So we've got ourselves a cup of coffee. The thing about this is, is because it's an open cup of coffee without a lid, we can lose heat out the top and we can lose water vapor out the top. That's gonna be a key hallmark of an open system. Not only can it lose or gain energy with respect to the system and the surroundings readily, it also can lose matter. So an open system will be able to lose matter. In this case with coffee, it's the water vapor or it could gain matter if it was a different, if the reaction was going, process, I'm sorry, was going the different way. It can also gain or lose energy with its surroundings very readily. So open, you can lose or gain matter and or energy. Closed. Now a closed system is going to exchange energy, but we're not going to, um, lose any matter. So the difference now with our coffee cup example is let's put a lid on this thing and let's close the lid. Closing the lid on this now, because this top part is plastic, we can still lose some energy out of it. Um, but by closing the lid on here, we hopefully have lost the ability to lose matter. Hopefully we're not losing water vapor anymore. Uh, as part of uh, the thermodynamic process that's going on. Um, I don't know if you all have ever done this. It kind of got frowned upon by the time that I was a kid. Uh, sun tea. If uh, I'm not advocating that you do this. So that's a thing. But sun tea is a process where you take a glass container, some kind of closed container, uh, fill it with water, throw a bunch of tea bags in it, and then close the top, and then set it out in the sun to brew for like half a day, a day, something like that. Um, you get tea, um, you can also get botulism, uh, or some other form of bacteria growth in there, which is why they don't suggest people do that anymore. But because it's glass, let's say it's glass, energy from the sun can come into the glass to warm up the water, but the water can't get out of the container. So you allow an energy transfer to occur, you just don't allow um, matter transfer to occur. So that's a closed system. Now let's talk about an isolated system. An isolated system is going to be something that does not exchange energy or matter. So theoretically, this mug, this like thermos mug, should be an isolated system. Um, if you've ever bought an, a thermos mug thing ever before, um, you will probably have seen on there where they will, like in the rack, Target, Walmart, Amazon, um, they'll say, well, this thermos keeps things hot for 28 hours. This thermos keeps things hot for 10 hours. This one keeps it for four days or whatever it is. The idea there is that it is such a good isolated system that we aren't able to exchange energy between the system and its surroundings. Now, typically in a chemistry course, uh, especially a general chemistry one course, we're going to focus on closed systems and isolated systems with respect to the kinds of problems that we're going to work. Open systems are very important. Just, get, just ask any chemical engineer or any engineer period, and they'll tell you that open systems are very vital to how things work. Um, uh, especially, especially industrially. A few more definitions. Um, let's talk about something that's called the internal energy of a system. So we've talked about 
the kinds of systems that we possibly had. We've defined what work is. We've said what potential energy is. We've said what kinetic energy is. Now let's talk about this thing we're going to call the internal energy of a system. Um, I'm going to use the symbol U for internal energy. Your textbook often uses the symbol E, like an uppercase E. Um, the reason that they use an E, I don't really know. But I do know that higher level chemistry courses use U. Um, so that's what we're going to use as well. The definition of internal energy of a system is the total energy contained within the system, be that as kinetic energy or potential energy. And if it's in some kind of um, place in between where it's not kinetic and not purely potential, it's just going to be the sum of the kinetic and the potential energy. Now, since we're a chemistry class, we're going to be thinking about molecules. So the kinetic energy for a molecule is going to come from uh, various types of motion that a molecule can have at the molecular level. And there's going to be three main types of motion that we're going to uh, need to be cognizant of. The first is translational, then rotational, and then vibrational motion. And uh, collectively, these three kinds of motion are what we refer to as thermal energy in chemistry. And I'm going to go over some details or and show you an example here of ro translational, rotational, and vibrational motion. So here at the top, you see this nice little orange ball over there. You would not believe how long it took me to program this into PowerPoint. So here's hoping it actually works. Here's an example of translational motion. Ah, oh, that's so good. Let's do it again. Ah, there it is. With translational motion, all we are doing is moving the molecule from one place to another. You can think of it as just sliding. It's not spinning or anything else like that. It's literally just sliding across. That's translational motion. That's our definition of translational motion. Um, we are translating molecule particle along. For rotational motion, you probably have a pretty good grasp on what this one is. Our molecule, our particle is spinning. It is rotating. So it is not translating. It's not moving its position in space. Now it is just spinning in one spot. And the last we have is our vibrational motion. And so we've got the purple ball and the two uh, smaller pink balls. We can think of all three of these as individual atoms. Um, and you can kind of think of this one as a water molecule. So we have the big ball, which we could say is an oxygen atom. And then we have the two smaller pink balls, which we could say are hydrogen atoms. The hydrogen atoms are just vibrating back and forth, back and forth, almost like a jazzercise kind of exercise or something like that. It's, the molecule isn't rotating. It's not translating in space. All that's happening is the individual atoms are moving with respect to one another. Now, this isn't the only kind of vibrational motion. We can also do the uh, Richard Simmons one arm out, then bring it back in, one arm out, then bring it back in. And so we could actually have a vibration that really looks just like anything from any Jazzercise video. I mean, if you don't know what Jazzercise is, I'm going to suggest that you spend a little bit of time on YouTube uh, enjoying that rabbit hole. These are the three types of motion that for a molecule, for a chemical, we're going to say contribute to its overall thermal energy. So it's not going to be just one or the others. All molecules are doing all three of these until you hit absolute zero. 
If you hit absolute zero, all motion stops. If you're not at absolute zero, you are doing some combination of all three of these simultaneously. How we doing? Good. All right. I'm going to open up chat, just make sure nobody, nope, still just me in there. That's cool. All right. Um, we're going to try to keep these videos a little bit shorter compared to the normal lecture time. So I'm just going to try to uh, finish up with some basic definitions so that when we um, virtually meet in the future, um, we'll be able to start doing some practice problems on this chapter. Um, just the first part of the thermochemistry is just so definition specific. And I would strongly advise everybody to just start working on those definitions um, because that's the number one uh, area where I see students have the most problems when it comes to working out problems. Um, people just forget what the definition is for system or kinetic energy or potential energy or what have you. Um, and so then you can't input the information into the right equation. Um, and so then people just go astray. So I really strongly suggest that you start working on those definitions, just kind of reading over them. And uh, we'll start working some practice problems probably tomorrow uh, as part of tomorrow's lecture regarding those. Back to some uh, basic definitions again. And then, like I said, we'll wrap up a little earlier here today um, since we're all getting used to this stuff. So potential energy, uh, when it comes to a molecule, because um, we described th the kinetic energy is the thermal energy and those kinds of motion, the potential energy is going to come from the interactions between the particles of matter. Um, what kind of interactions are we talking about? Well, we're saying things like the interactions that hold the protons and the neutrons together. But those kinds of interactions you learn about in particle physics. Um, these are not going to change in a chemical reaction. They might in a nuclear reaction, but the protons and the neutrons aren't going to uh, be interacting themselves in a chemical reaction. So for chemistry 150, we're not going to worry about th that kind of interaction. However, uh, we would be interested in the next two types. The first one is electrostatic attractions. Um, and so these are what produce a chemical bond for our chemicals. Um, if you've had a chemistry course before, you may be familiar with the term intramolecular force. This will be one of the last things that we cover in chemistry 150, so you don't have to have that explicit definition down. But right now, I do want you to think of as an electrostatic force um, that holds the uh, chemicals together, like holds the atoms together within a molecule. That is an electrostatic force, and we call it an intramolecular force. An electrostatic uh, attraction between individual molecules is what we're going to call an intermolecular force. Um, the old school example I used to use between intra and inter had to deal with, uh, back in the day, we had this thing that we called the intranet, and that would be uh, computers all on the same network versus the internet, which is computers not on the same network. Yeah, they were still all able to communicate with one another. It's just if you were on an intranet, it was like uh, my UND where you have to have a login and then you could access the resources. That's kind of an example of an intranet. Um, it lets everybody know, hey, yeah, you're part of this thing. Um, whereas an internet, you can just access whatever, like Reddit. Um, chemical interactions between atoms, we're going to say are uh, between atoms in a molecule are intramolecular forces. The attractions between individual molecules, the things that holds them together is either a liquid or a solid or that hold them very weakly together in terms of a gas. Those are intermolecular forces. Those electrostatic interactions are what we're going to uh, be focused on for the potential energy of a chemical. And this is what we're going to call chemical 
energy. So breaking up an atom, or I'm sorry, breaking up a, a molecule in something such as combustion, that's a chemical process. We don't have to worry about the protons or the neutrons reorganizing themselves, um, but combusting some kind of hydrocarbon releases a lot of energy. And that release of energy comes from disrupting the electro electrostatic attractions, not only between the individual molecules, but also uh, between the atoms within those molecules. That liberates a lot of energy in the form of a when you do a combustion reaction. That's what we call chemical energy. Okay, we're gonna do, I think, uh, one more slide here and then we're gonna call it quits for the day. Um, he heat is, like we described earlier, um, we're gonna use the symbol Q. Um, I don't know why we used Q for heat. It somebody, made sense to somebody. Specifically, the definition of heat that we're going to use in chemistry is the energy transfer between a system and its surroundings. Um, and this energy transfer is going to occur because we have a different, a different temperature between the system and the surroundings. The system and the surroundings are constantly trying to reach the same temperature. And so they're going to do this kind of like hot potato juggling uh, of energy um, in order to get them to be at the same amount of energy. But that hot potatoing is going to happen spontaneously. And by definition, we for spontaneous here, we mean uh, without any kind of nudging. So it's gonna happen on its own from the high temperature thing into the low temperature thing. So the low temperature thing isn't gonna pass energy into the high temperature thing. It will pass high the energy from the high temperature thing to the low temperature thing though. Think about that example of holding an ice cube in your hand again. Your hand is higher temperature than the ice cube. So your energy from you goes into said ice cube, it melts said ice cube. Once the surroundings and the system have the same temperature, we, and have the same amount of energy, we say that they have reached thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium is just really us saying, hey, then they're good. Um, we're going to talk about equilibrium in general chemistry too, uh, to greater detail. So stay tuned for that. Now there's some terminology that we just usually use, uh, in parlance. Um, so we might, uh, and that is just to say regular slang or whatnot. Um, but we have to be careful about that in chemistry. So for example, uh, we say, in chemistry, a system will gain heat or it will lose heat. Um, we will say that something, uh, we will say that the heat flows from one thing to another thing, but we're not gonna use the terminology of something contains heat. The thing contains energy, but we're going to say heat, we're gonna use heat in terms of uh, measuring that flow of energy from one thing to another. So that's just a little nuance, uh, particular thing that uh, language-wise you're gonna see. Um, something you're gonna hear me probably say is uh, how much he, uh, energy does something cost? Because I, uh, and in certain fields of chemistry, think about energy changes in terms of uh, almost like on a bank ledger or like your checkbook, like a deposit or a withdrawal of energy. So does it take energy from the system or does it uh, gain energy into the system? So does it cost heat? Um, would just be a way of saying how much energy is necessary to uh, have a reaction occur. Um, the energy transfer at the molecular level. Um, I'll try to find a nice little diagram of this for everybody. I'm gonna write myself a note here for this because I don't have a nice slide um, articulating this. Um, which slide is this? Slide 174 picture. And I'll try to get that uh, posted on the support site. Um, 
in essence, yeah, I'll, I'll just try to put up a, a little addendum regarding that slide because uh, without being able to draw something for you here right now, uh, I think it's going to be pretty hard. Okay, we are at 36 minutes uh, into the presentation, 35 minutes into the recording. Um, if I cover the next little bit, we'll actually be able to do some problems tomorrow. So I'm going to go over work and then because we'll ha then have enough energy over, or I'm sorry, we'll have enough uh, knowledge about heat and work. We'll actually be able to discuss some problems tomorrow. Um, so I think I said the last slide was going to be the last one. Apologies. This next one's going to be it. So work, um, we're going to use the symbol W, making life easy for ourselves uh, for once. And this is going to res uh, refer to the another energy transfer between system and surroundings. Um, specifically, though, our system is not going to do work. Uh, we're going to say that... Um, I'll show you what that means here in a second. There's lots of kinds of work, but we're specifically going to focus on pressure volume work. Um, and this has to do with gases and what happens when a gas is uh, compressed or a gas expands. And I thought the image was on this slide, but it isn't. So we're going here. Here's a very classic example of what we're talking about for pressure volume work. So inside the cylinder, um, and this is the same cylinder, it's just a before and an after. So VI is initial and VF is final. And I'd like to do a little call out to LibreTexts. Uh, it's a really great resource uh, for online chemistry information. And that's where this image came from. So they did all this. They're awesome. Can't say enough uh, good things about them. Um, but the volume initial there on the uh, left, the purple is the gas. That purple part, we would say, is our system. The gray disc on the top is the top of a cylinder head. Um, so it can float up and down. But the thing about this is it's going to be a closed system. So we're not going to lose any matter. We can allow an energy change, but we're not going to lose matter. That PEXT is the external pressure um, being forced upon the system by the surroundings. So whatever the external pressure of our surroundings is, that's what that pressure external is. V final, um, let's say that we have now increased the pressure of the external uh, surroundings. And that caused the gas, the purple part, to get compressed. So pressure external increased, now we have a compression of the gas in our system. Because this is a cylinder, we have the nice equation for the volume of a cylinder being volume uh, area times height. And since we can measure the area and the height of cylinders uh, pretty readily, we can figure out, well, here's the difference in the height between the initial and the final volume. So we can figure out what our change in volume is. How is that helpful? Well, if we go back to this PV uh, definition of work, if we assume that pressure external is always going to be the number that's given to us, or I'm sorry, the number, uh, if we say that the pressure external is uh, given to us, the change in volume, delta V, we can take the pressure times the change in volume and we can get work. So we end up with an equation that looks like this. This work equals pressure times delta V. Um, then this is where engineers and chemists diverge. Uh, because a gas can either be compressed or it can be expanded, we end up with delta V being either a value that's going to be greater than 1 or less than 1, depending on if the final or the initial volume of the gas is greater than or less than um, where it started. So punchline, we're going to define work as, and that dot in the front of the W there is just a bullet point. We're going to define work as W equals delta, or I'm sorry, work equals negative P times delta V. 
we're going to put a pin in it about the uh, definitions right there for now. I will make sure that these slides are posted on the site. So if you thought that our, we went pretty quickly and you didn't be able, weren't able to write everything down, or if you want to go back over some of that uh, text, by all means, you'll be able to. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit the stop on the recording now. So uh, let's see here. I'm going to hit stop but I'm not gonna set stop on the video. So if you're in the class, stick around and I can answer any questions you've got. And